I'm just listening to this lovely piano music by Granados and I'm listening to it through this analog to digital converter or rather digital to analog converter by Marantz from the 1980s. What a beautiful piece of equipment this is and uh, it belongs to a friend of mine and I've just been fixing it because there was a noise on on one of the connections and before I closed it up and give it back to him I thought it might be fun just to share some of the pictures I've taken over the last couple of months of this and some other equipment I've looked at. I also fixed an amplifier which had a broken digital optical input and a CD player which needed a new belt, a new power cord and a general scene to. Um, and this is such beautiful equipment. It goes back to the 1980s I believe and is among the first really high class, top quality digital playback equipment from the era as we moved from analog recording and vinyl to digital CDs and all the rest of it we're so familiar now. So I took lots of pictures while I did it. Some of them are better than others but I, I find these devices really beautiful inside and I marvel at the construction and the quality and how well they've lasted and how beautiful they sound. So I might just listen to a bit more music and while I'm doing that I'll uh, fade out and we'll look for some more pictures. So, let's take a closer look at the three Marantz Hi-Fi units I've been working on during the year. The first was the Marantz PM75 integrated amplifier, which had a damaged optical input. It had been knocked and was only working intermittently. I took some pictures while working on this, but I can't find one now of the whole amplifier before or after the repair, so these give mainly a close-up and inside view. The input socket is a component that is soldered to a PCB and then is available to plug into through a hole in the rear cover. On removing the covers, it became clear that the board with the optical socket was part of a stacked set of PCBs. So to get to the solder joints, I needed to remove the board on top of it. There was also a metal cover for the converter section and a number of leads which needed to be removed. For each section, I put the screws into a separate bag or container and of course took lots of photos so that I would get everything back together correctly. The two PCBs are electrically joined by long pin headers which need to be prized apart and pushed back together very carefully. Rough or quick handling could lead to sections of solder track being pulled from the PCB which would completely wreck the equipment. Once the board was removed, the lower board could be unscrewed and finally that whole input section of the amplifier was empty and the PCB with the optical input was ready to be examined. I supported the board on some polystyrene packaging to protect the header pins as well as the other components while I examined the solder joints. It was clear that there was some movement in the socket and so I applied some flux and removed the solder from the joints with solder mop wick. Flux really helps to get the solder flowing. Once I had it free, I could see that a pin had actually come loose inside the socket, causing the intermittent connection, so it really was necessary to replace it. After removing any leftover solder and a clean with some alcohol wipes, the PCB was ready for a refit. I secured the new part to the board with some tack and positioned it on my soldering station and then it was a quick and easy job to solder it into place. Now it was time the boards went back in. The top one had to be carefully aligned while the two of them were very gently squeezed back together so all the connections were in place. I then needed to plug in all the cables again and soon everything on the chassis was back where it should be. To test the amplifier, I took an optical line out from a Walkman CD player of similar 1980s vintage and plugged it into the new torque socket. And of course, I had to play a 1980s Japanese CD to make sure the sound was really authentic. And to complete the test, I found a 1980s music fan to appreciate the result. When I handed back the amplifier, I was asked to take a look at the CD94 CD player. This had a damaged power cord that had been cut off and a faulty tray mechanism with a CD stuck inside the player. 
Taking the top off gave me a view of the initial problem and I looked at the downloaded service manual to make sure I disassembled the unit properly. As the various panels came off, the very accessible modular nature of the design became clear. This was very helpful as I realised that I needed to remove the power supply board to get to the solder joints for the power cord replacement. With a unit like this, I sometimes find it's helpful to put it onto a portable work stand instead of a bench. This means I can access it from all around and avoids awkward twists and turns when it can only be faced from one side. It's potentially damaging to move a piece of equipment that has some of its insides hanging out. The power cord has large solder traces and pads, so there was a lot of solder to remove. To make sure this happens smoothly and quickly, I covered the joints in tacky flux and used Servisol solder mop along with a large soldering iron tip. It's essential to have enough thermal mass for a task like this. Too small a tip and not enough heat would lead to a prolonged and difficult removal which could damage the board. This went really well though, with the solder flowing quickly into the copper weave and soon the tags were clear and the old wire just pulled out. Fitting the new power leads was straightforward, again with some flux to help the solder flow and plenty of heat from a big solder tip with minimum contact time. While in this area of the player, I noticed that the voltage regulator housing had a damaged fitting, so I replaced the existing fixing with a bolt and locking nut. So with the power cord reconnected and safety ensured, I turned my attention to the transport mechanism. After manually sliding out the tray and removing the CD, I couldn't see any obvious problem with the mechanism, so I decided to go ahead and replace the belt with the one I'd bought as a service item. While I was checking the CD mechanism, I blew out any dust and cleaned the laser lens with some alcohol. To change the belt, I unclipped the motor, moved it back and checked that it worked properly without the belt. Replacing it though was a bit trickier than I anticipated and I had to very gently squeeze apart some of the plastic to slide the belt in and round with some anxiety about breaking anything. Thankfully, everything went back together and the mechanism was restored to full functionality. Which brings me back to the latest repair in this Marant series of Hi-Fi units, the CDA94 digital to analog converter, which was launched as a companion to the CD player in 1986. This Marant series of Hi-Fi separates uses the TDA1541A converter chip. This converter has a similar modular construction to the amplifier and CD player, and I just love looking inside these units. It does exactly what it says it will do, takes in digital signals through optical or phono sockets, and gives them back out as an analog signal through balanced XLR sockets, fixed or variable level phono sockets. On the front panel, there's a diagram of signal path and a few straightforward controls. The problem as described was noise and crackling from the output sockets. And at first I couldn't get this to happen, but then I found that putting a bit of pressure vertically on the socket affected the connection. Looking inside, I realised that the sockets were PCB mounted sealed units, unlike the more conventional screw threaded RCA phono sockets. Looking underneath at the solder joints, I couldn't see any obvious problem. The solution turned out to be simple. With the passing of the years, the various screws holding the socket, chassis and panels together had shifted or loosened and there was a bit of play in the phono socket units against the back panel. The socket connections inside the units were able to flex as they moved, introducing noise. By loosening, repositioning and then retightening all the mounting screws, everything went back properly into place, the movement was eliminated and all the noise and problems disappeared. So, this was a simple fix and the experience of working with all three units was very valuable. Although I'm often hesitant to work on other people's much-loved gear, my takeaway from this is that it's worth checking for obvious faults and it is possible to restore equipment that is a bit tired with relatively straightforward fault-finding and basic techniques. So, I hope you did find that enjoyable uh, and interesting. I really enjoyed looking at this equipment and the other two bits I fiddled with earlier in the years, you've just seen in the pictures. 
and if it was helpful to you and you enjoyed watching it please subscribe to our channel and if you want to know when we upload another video uh, please ring the bell icon. I'm a bit slower than I'd like to be with this one of the reasons being that here in rural Somerset in in Britain in the deep countryside uh, the broadband speed is close to zero and it's quite an effort to actually upload a video but I'm going to keep trying and I'm hoping that will change soon. Anyway I'll be back as soon as I can Thanks for watching. I'm going to listen to some more music now.